Hi, welcome to Leading Lights. I'm Greg Donaldson. Today, we're going to be looking at the story of Moses and the burning bush. An amazing story. In Exodus chapter 3, it says that the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush does not burn. We're looking at the whole idea of being consumed by God. God is a consuming fire. He wants to consume more and more of our lives because that's where we find true joy, fulfillment, peace. But often God attracts our attention by a burning bush, something that interests us, something that grabs our attention. And as we look at it, Moses said, I will turn aside and look at this bush and see why it is not consumed. Then we start the process of getting closer and closer to God. I just want to clar clarify this one point here. Why was the bush not consumed? The reason is because God is a spiritual fire. Uh, a physical fire consumes a bush and God can consume physical things. There are times in the Bible where God's physical fire consumes. But for you and I, God comes as a spiritual fire. He comes within us with his spiritual power and he does not consume your physical flesh. He wants you to cooperate with the fire of his spirit and allow the changes to happen. I'm sure you remember the verse in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It, it says, Brethren, because of the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And the picture is similar to the Old Testament sacrifice, where an animal was put on the altar and then the fire came and consumed it fully. But in Romans 12, it says, for you and I, we look at the mercy of God, the love of God, that Jesus has forgiven our sins, and we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. We're not consumed by the fire. We're not killed by a knife. We are a living sacrifice. But then it goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's the next step. We, we come to God. We say, God, I give my life to you. I put my life on your altar. And as we renew our minds, that consuming fire of his spirit and his power within us starts to change our lives. We change from glory to glory. That word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho, which is, is like a butterfly coming out of a chrysalis. A, 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 a worm goes in, a caterpillar goes in, and a butterfly comes out. We are transformed. That's what happened to Moses. He saw the burning bush. It wasn't consumed because it was a spiritual flame, and he allowed the Spirit of God to change him. Friend, you and I need to come to God. We have probably been attracted by something that catches our eye. In fact, you may have turned on this TV program today by mistake or something just captured your attention and now you are in exactly the same position that Moses was in. You are at the point where you can choose. Will I look closer or will I just carry on with what I'm doing? And I encourage you to do what Moses did. Moses said, I will look at this site. I will see what's going on. And as he approached God's consuming fire came into his heart. And at the end of the story, which we're going to see today, Moses was a changed man for the rest of his life. He lived another 40 years after this. For the rest of his life, he was like the burning bush. God's fire was burning within him. People were attracted to the flame within him. In fact, his face sometimes shone with the glory of God. They were attracted, but it didn't consume him fully. His physical body was only consumed when he died and he went to heaven. You and I are the same. Present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Renew our minds and allow the flame to burn within us. And as we do that, others will be attracted to our flame. God bless you as you watch this today. Praise the Lord. It's so great to see you. Thank you for being here. We are doing a series of sermons called Consumed. God is a consuming fire, but we as a culture are consumers. We pick 
the restaurant, the food, the supermarket, the show, the TV station. We, we pick, we pick, we pick, and we come into the kingdom of God, and there's a bit of a disconnect and a, and a conflict between me wanting to consume and God wanting to consume me. Uh, my friend was very picky when he came to choosing a wife. There were all these girls who were, would have been a perfect wife for him, but he was so picky. <laughs> he would say, oh, she's great, except, and he would find some tiny little reason. And as a result, he missed out on years. Eventually, he did get married, but he came into this relationship that's supposed to not be a consumer relationship, but he brought in his consumer mindset that is just a part, it's like we, we flow along in this river, this culture we live in as consumers. We're so used to picking, 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 being critical, being the one, they must please me, I'm the consumer, they must please me, they must entertain me, they must make me feel special. And there are some relationships, like marriage and like with God, where if you come in as a consumer, you lose. But if you come in and you say, consume me, you win. And that's the idea behind the series of sermons. Did you know that Matt Damon, the actor, met his wife? She was serving drinks behind a bar. And I just think that story is so lovely because he was a consumer. He goes into the bar and he says, do I like the decor? Do I like the selection of drinks? Do I like the company? I'm a consumer, I com I'm a consumer. Are the prices right? Does the person behind the bar speak to me nicely and treat me well and make me feel special? Yes, I'll buy this drink. But within a, a short amount of time, he was consumed with love for this woman and she and their relationship and her love had consumed him and he no longer was picking and choosing he had chosen and he was consumed by that relationship she as well used to go to the movies and say i like tom cruise today matt damon oh, i'm not so sure about that movie the script oh, it's a bit long very picky very particular very critical very judgmental it's like we put ourselves on a pedestal when we're consumers and the world around us makes us feel so special. You know, a good shop, when you go into a good shop, the person behind the counter smiles at you and they make you feel so special and they make you feel like you really are the only person that matters on the planet. Oh, you're so wonderful and we, get duped into it and we want to believe it so we say yes i am the most important person in the world feed me serve me entertain me but actually it's a false reality if that person wasn't trying to sell you something there's no way they would make you feel that special i'm sorry if i burst your bubble right now <laughs> but the great news is god is the only one really who is worthy of our trust when we say, God, consume me. Obviously, in a marriage and various other relationships, you can give of yourself, you can be vulnerable, you can allow that relationship and that person to consume you. But God is the ultimate. And my purpose in this talk and in these talks is to say, please do not allow this false consumer culture to prevent you from being consumed by the king of the universe where you will find the ultimate satisfaction, joy, peace and life that exists. Please, don't miss it because of a cultural problem. We were in America for a couple of years in the 1990s and we got so into the culture of the restaurants in America where it's a refillable drink. You buy one drink and they just keep coming and refilling your drink. It's often as much as you can eat buffet. You pay once, you eat as much as you like. They're just falling over themselves to serve you, to be nice to you. The waiter gets to know your name and you know their name and they put a smiley face on the invoice when they bill you and they, they're just so super. And we were so into the consumer culture and then we flew back home and we landed in England. We spent a couple of days in Cambridge and we went to a tiny little out of the way cafe where the consumer culture had not yet reached. 
<laughs> and I remember sitting there and I got my sandwich or whatever it was and, and there was no salt. And I said to the waiter, oh, he wouldn't even look at me. So eventually I went up to the counter. I said, please, can we have some salt? Expecting them to fall over themselves and just give me salt. They said, that'll be 20p, please. And I was suddenly shocked by the reality of, oh, maybe, it, maybe it's not as I thought it was. Moses, in Exodus chapter 3, was like that. He had, let me just fill you in a little bit on the background of Moses. He's 80 years old at this stage. The first, Moses' life is divided up easily into three segments. The first 40 years, he lived as a privileged prince in the king's palace of Egypt. He had been adopted by the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and brought up as a privileged special kid. You know, the one who gets everything, he's hoity-toity, everyone runs around after him, he's very um, entitled. A consumer, I guess. And at the age of 40, something stirred within him. He realized he's a Hebrew and the Hebrew slaves are being mistreated. And something stirs within him and he feels, I must help these people. And he kills an Egyptian soldier who was mistreating a Hebrew. And they, the country finds out about it and he has to flee because he's wanted for murder. And the next 40 years, he's wandering around in the wilderness looking after sheep forgotten by everybody, wondering if God even exists, not sure who he is. And at this point, at the age of 80, after 40 years of wandering around, he meets God, but in the most extraordinary circumstances. And we're going to read about it and learn what we can from it today. In Exodus 3, it says, verse 1, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So he's wandering around. It's another day at the office. He's got his stick, which he uses to look after the sheep. He's just boring, old, humdrum, everyday work. And in verse 2, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. You know, Moses could have missed this opportunity. He could have walked past looked at the flame in the in the bush and thought hmm that's interesting that's quite curious but there's something more interesting it's the end of the day i'm tired there's a nice cold whatever the the drink of the day was waiting for me there's a lovely wife zipporah waiting for me oh, I'm, I'm too busy i'm not going to look but he turned aside he was interested in something there was something that caught his eye. And many of us, that's how we came to know God. The same as Moses, we saw something. It's usually a flame burning inside a human being, but it doesn't consume them. You know, that's the way God works. He doesn't come with physical fire and consume us physically and force us to be his servant or to do his will or to love him. He comes as a spiritual flame from the inside. And as we are interested, as we turn our face towards him, as we listen to him and allow him to consume us, the flame burns brighter within us. But it never fully consumes us until we get to heaven. There's always the husk of a human being, but the flame of a supernatural God burning on the inside. And you may have come to church because your friend or a family member seem to have a flame of God in them. Or maybe you read something or heard something on the internet, or you read the Bible, and you thought, I will turn aside and I will look at this strange thing. We come in as consumers. All of us do. That's how we first come to God. We say, I'm interested in this. This might be, there might be something here. Maybe 
God can satisfy something in me that the world has not been able to satisfy. And Moses did that. He turned aside to look. And from that moment on, his life was never the same again. God said to him, take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy ground. And this is always the first challenge for us to be consumed by God is, will you be consumed by the majesty of God? Let me just talk about this for a couple of moments. We come in as consumers saying, entertain me, entertain me. I've been to a lovely show, I've watched a lovely TV thing, I've seen a film, I've listened to music, entertain me. And we come to God and we say, entertain me. And He says, no, look at who I am and be consumed by me. It's not about you being entertained being made to feel goosebumpy and nice and excited and pleasant inside. My majesty, I deserve, in fact, I demand to be worshipped. And this is the first challenge. This is the first rung on the ladder of being consumed by God is will you worship him because he is God and because he deserves to be worshipped. You know, he deserves it. His character is flawless. His love and mercy is amazing. His presence is awesome. The, the things that he's done in the past are just amazing. And the things that he promises to do in the future are incredible. He deserves to be worshipped just for who he is, not because you feel good. And this is the first challenge. Will you be consumed by God's majesty? I always giggle inside when somebody says to me, the worship was okay, but it didn't do much for me today. And I hold my tongue, but I would love to say, it wasn't for you. The worship was not designed to entertain you. It was designed to give glory to Him. And that's the only thing that matters. It matters nothing how entertained you were. All that matters is we give glory to the King of the universe. Because that's what worship is. It's me saying, I am not the center of the universe. God is. I am not the one who deserves to be the focus of attention. He is. That's worship. And this is the first challenge in being consumed. And Moses passed the test. He worshiped God. The second challenge is God says, will you be consumed by my message? God said to Moses, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he described who he was in verse 6. And then again from verse 13 onwards of Exodus 3, God starts telling Moses about himself. Moses says, who are you, God? Who shall I say has sent me? And God starts revealing to Moses who he is. He, he uses the name Yahweh, I am that I am, which is sometimes called Jehovah, sometimes called Yahweh. But this is the first time that God says, this is my name. Moses says, who, you, who are you? He says, I am that I am. And he starts to reveal some of himself to Moses. And Moses could have been consumed with his own life, with his career, with his family, with I don't know, all the different things, how he'd learnt about looking after sheep, about all the different interesting things in his life. But he allowed his mind and his heart to be consumed by the message that God was giving him. He said, I want to learn from you, God. Not, I am imposing my ideas on your message. I'm wondering if your message tickles my ears and makes me feel good. No, no. I am willing to be consumed by whatever it is you want to say to me, consume me. Psalm 119 verse 128, David says, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. That is the word of a person who has been consumed by God's message. God, whatever you say about anything you say it on, it's right. I'm, I'm allowing your message to consume me and change me rather than me imposing my ideas on your message. That's the second way that Moses was consumed and he passed the test. And the third thing 
that Moses was consumed by. He was consumed by God's mission, God's heartbeat, God's passion, God's desire and dream for his people to be set free from Egypt. God's heart was beating with compassion and love for his people who were slaves and he said I'm concerned about them and he described to Moses his his mission to set them free from Egypt to make them free from slavery to give them liberty and Moses got it how are you on God's mission you see we can tell whether we consumed by whether we say, God, help me in my mission, or whether we say, God, I am consumed by whatever it is you are doing on planet Earth. God, help me in my career, find my spouse, become self-actualized and better and fulfilled and happy and successful and prosperous, da 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 da. Lord, do we say, God, help my mission, or do we say, God, I sign up as a lowly infantryman in your mission. What is it, God? Give me your orders. And the next little passage in Exodus chapter 4, the next chapter is what I want to end with to show you how this process works. God says to Moses, what is that in your hand? Exodus 4 verse 2. So the Lord said to Moses, what is that in your hand? And Moses said, a rod, a stick, a piece of wood. A dry, useless, dead piece of wood. It no longer has any life in it. It's probably just been dead for years. Moses has probably been using it as worn down where he grabs it and where he uses it to do his work with it, looking after the sheep. It's a piece of wood. If it wasn't for this passage, this piece of wood would have been forgotten like the numerous other pieces of wood that are thrown away every day all over the world. But... God turned this piece of wood into a thing called the rod of God. In Exodus 4 verse 20, 20 verses later, at the end of this passage, it says, Then Moses took his wife, his sons, he set them on a donkey, he returned to the land of Egypt, and he took the rod of God in his hand. Something changed a stick from being useless to being the rod of God. You say, what is the rod of God? Well, all of the plagues in Egypt, Moses used the rod of God to turn the Nile to blood, to bring the frogs and the locusts and the boils and the darkness and all that. Then when they escaped from Egypt, as they're going through the Red Sea, God says, hold the rod out over the sea and the sea will part. This little piece of wood has changed into the rod of God. And Moses, the little piece of human nothingness has turned into God's servant because he's being consumed instead of wanting to consume. The rod goes on from there. It, it doesn't end at the Red Sea. They go through the Red Sea and they come out and they're in the desert and they're thirsty and they're crying out to Moses. And God says, take this stick. Remember that little old stick that was nothing? Take it and strike that rock over there and water will come out. God produces life-giving, refreshing water out of a dead thing, out of your useless life. I'm sorry to insult you, but in, in the big scheme of things, most of our lives are very inconsequential. But when I give it to God, it becomes something that produces life. Later on, the Amalekite army come against the Israelites and, and Moses holds up the rod of God in his hand. And as he holds it up, the Israelites win the war. But when his arms get tired and he, and he lowers them, then the Amalekites start winning. The rod of God gives you victory and power in your life. Why? Is it special? It's just a piece of wood. But when it's consumed by the king, it becomes something amazing. Later on, Many years later, number 17, there's a, a, a rebellion, a leadership squabble. The Israelite nation rise up against Moses and his brother and sister, and they say, who are you to lead us? And God says, I'm going to settle this for once and for all. Each of you take your sticks, because each tribe, the leader would have had a stick. And he says, put your sticks in the tabernacle in front of my presence and in the morning you'll see who is the leader that I've chosen for these people and they come in in the morning what are we gonna see what's God done Moses's stick has blossomed and budded and there's ripe almond fruit 
on it. Fruitfulness, life, beauty. You know, the, I don't know if you know almond blossom. There's the bright green leaves. There's the lovely almond nuts, which look like fruit. And there's these whitish pink petals, just beaut luxuriant, coming out of one stick. The rest are still dead, but one stick has life flowing out of it. And that's a picture of Moses' life he was a nobody wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years aimlessly wondering what is my purpose in life you might be that person saying what is my purpose in life stop picking the entertainment that you think will satisfy you and say God consume me God let your majesty consume me I worship you because of who you are not because it makes me feel good God let your message consume me whatever you say is right Lord let your mission consume me whatever you want to do on planet earth I'm in for it and God says I will turn you from a dry dead piece of wood into a luxuriant and fruitful thing of beauty the rod of God of power but also of life and fruitfulness tell my friends and neighbours about Jesus? How can I do more for God? Have you considered starting a small meeting where you discuss the Bible and talk about God? You just need to invite a couple of people and show them God's love. Leading Lights will help you with the rest. We have free resources, prayer teams, and seasoned church leaders who want to help you do great things for the Lord. Visit leadinglightsnetwork.com or download the Leading Lights app from all app stores. <laughs>